in oh, yeah. person, okay. and then other people logging yeah, in individually. We've we've become very hybrid in nature. <laughs> yeah, totally. We're the same way. I, yeah. I you wouldn't know that anyone works here if you walk down this hallway here. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Um, Ricardo, maybe you can, since you're there, you can give me the signal as to whether or not to go ahead and start. We are all ready, so we can start now. Okay. All right. Well, uh, welcome to Integrative Biology Seminar. And today we are um, hosting Eric Riddell, who's coming from Iowa State University. Um, and Eric was a Clemson graduate, got his dissertation in 2018. Um, before moving on to uh, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley and then landing his job at Iowa State. Um, and he has done a really wide variety of work on ecophysiology and a lot of different vertebrate taxa. I was guessing that he has pretty much studied all terrestrial vertebrates we discovered. And then he, he now has some invert papers coming out as well. And what's really cool about his work is he integrates um, a modeling approach with like you know, real physiology studies um, to like better predict distributional changes and population level changes. Um, and for these efforts and the excitement that his work is generating, he was um, chosen as the George Bartholomew, Bartholomew speaker at a site of integrative and comparative biology, which is an award for young investigators who are making a big splash in their field. So congratulations, Eric, and thanks so much for coming today and sharing your work with us first. Uh, great. Um, thank you so much for having me. Before I get started, you can hear me and everything looks good? Yes, looks great. Okay, great. So the title of my talk today is uh, Organismal Physiology as a Lens into the Fundamental Niche. And, and I also want to say thank you, um, first of all, to the students that invited me. Uh, it really means a lot, especially as a young scientist, to uh, be invited by students. And I'm really excited you, to share my philosophy with you today, as well as some of my more recent research. So today what you're looking uh, at right now is uh, the Mojave Desert, which we'll be talking about this landscape quite a bit during the last two thirds of my talk. Um, but my talk is really gonna span uh, multiple types of environments, including the Southern Appalachians as well, which is where I started some of my research uh, on terrestrial salamanders. But really what I wanna do is, is stress the importance of taking an organismal approach and understanding how organisms directly interact with their environment. So when we talk about the fundamental niche, why do we care? And there's really three main reasons why we care. One, the fundamental niche can tell us something about species coexistence. We can look at the extent to which fun fundamental niches overlap, compete with competing species. We can look at species distributions and understand uh, what are the environmental factors that structure where organisms live. And finally, we can use it to understand extinction risk when environmental conditions change and, and exceed that uh, of the, the niche of the particular animal we're talking about. But let's back up for a second. What is the fundamental niche? Now, there are a few different definitions of the niche in general, but G. Evelyn Hutchinson's niche uh, is probably one of the most uh, often repeated in which the fundamental niche is a volume in which every point corresponds to the state of an environment that would permit the species to exist indefinitely. So I have this cartoon of what Hutchinson proposed. And what you're really looking at is that each one of these points inside this volume that makes up this volume is a state of the environment. Let's say that can be you know, temperature or humidity or, or really um, any part aspect of the environment. But even though this definition, you know, we all know it, uh, it's taught in ecology classes, um, even Hutchinson in the exact same paper, almost in the exact same breath, admitted that this definition and this idea was equal parts obvious and obscure. And I think that the obscurity of the fundamental niche really starts to be more apparent when you start asking questions about it. So, one of the questions that I think about a lot is how does one actually measure the indimensional hypervolume? So we can think about one of the axes here. Let's say this axis was temperature because we'll be talking about temperature quite a bit today. One of these points within this volume might be 
a single particular temperature, let's call it 32 degrees Celsius for the sake of argument. The problem is, is that animals may rarely experience this temperature. It may only happen for very brief periods of time. And if we look across the whole planet, there really isn't uh, any place, at least on the terrestrial uh, environment, where temperatures don't vary uh, daily, right? Even in the tropics, right? So these static temperatures that we may see as part of the fundamental niche really is, it can be somewhat misleading in terms of um, the types of conditions that these animals uh, really live in. The point being is if you, if you held an organism at 32 degrees Celsius, it's, it's unlikely that they would survive and reproduce indefinitely, right? That they can might be only able to tolerate those conditions for a short period of time. Another question that uh, really kind of uh, frustrated me was uh, how do organismal traits shape the fundamental niche? Of course, this definition of the fundamental niche doesn't really have any sort of descriptors of what's going on at the level of the organism. Um, rather, it's this sort of environmental space, right? Not why that organism can actually live in that environmental space. So in order to uh, address this, this problem and, and, and answer these questions, I turned to the field of ecophysiology, which I describe very broadly as understanding how organisms function in their environment, with the organism and the environment being the two major players here. And when we think about organisms there's and how organisms function, there's a lot of different levels that we can think about this. At the level of the animal, the whole organism, the organ, the tissue, the cell, and all the way down to its genome. My research program spans this biological hierarchy of organization. I study things like metabolism and water loss and histology and functional genomics to basically understand how organisms respond to environmental change and the factors that uh, structure the fundamental niche, specifically the organismal factors. Right? But the organism, like we have been talking about, is only half of the piece of the puzzle. The other piece is the environment, which we know varies over space, like temperature and time. Um, uh, well, temperature and humidity both vary over space and time uh, as temperatures cycle throughout the day and throughout the year. And so it's this combination of the organism and its environment, as well as the integration across the biological hierarchy of organization, which influences where we find these organisms across the landscape and of course, um, how this ultimately structures their species distribution. So we have these two pieces of the puzzle here that we've been talking about, the organism and the environment. And the problem is that often the environmental conditions that we have aren't at a scale that's really relevant to the organism that we're studying. For instance, climate data that you might download off of online might not be relevant for an animal that rarely experiences air temperature. So to combat this problem, I turn to biophysics. And biophysics really helps us link organisms to their local environmental conditions. And what biophysics helps us do is, is use this series of first principles of physics to understand thermodynamics of organisms. And why do we care about thermodynamics? Because for ectotherms in particular, uh, changing environmental conditions, changing temperatures are known to be tightly um, associated with performance. Uh, things like how much energy they can bring in uh, and their ability to compete with other species and, and so on. So using physical principles, we can gain insight into the body temperatures that they experience and thus how performance changes uh, in different environmental conditions. So biophysics is this really important puzzle piece that helps us link the organism to their environment. So I'm first gonna briefly talk about an example of this with my dissertations work, uh, where I studied this philosophy using the Southern Great Cheek Salamander, Plethodon metcalfi. The salamander is really interesting for a variety of reasons. These are just some of its uh, traits that are really important to understanding what it means to be a salamander. They're fossorial, so they live predominantly underground. They come out at night, they're nocturnal, to eat and find mates, and they're fully terrestrial. So unlike a lot of other amphibians, they don't need water to breed, they just lay eggs um, underground. And they're also lungless. Now, they're lungless in order to reduce energetic costs. 
Um, but one of the consequences of being lungless is that they need to breathe across their skin. And in order to breathe across your skin, you need to have really thin skin and that skin needs to very, be very wet, just like your lungs. So they're basically like a walking lung, uh, essentially. Now, this unique trait of having really thin, wet skin plays a really big role in where you find these salamanders. So here, what we're looking at is a heat map of species richness of Southern Appalachia. Uh, this is where we find the highest density of these lungless salamanders. Uh, it's the global hotspot of salamander diversity. And this is because the Southern Appalachian Mountains are a temperate rainforest. Um, they're really cool, they're very, very wet, and it's a really great place if you wanna breathe across your skin uh, when, uh, and you need it to be really wet. Now, having this really thin, wet skin means that you're very vulnerable to drying out really quickly. So water loss rates have been one of the really critical physiological traits that we've uh, tried to study with um, amphibians in general, but in particular, uh, lungless salamanders. When we uh, study water loss rates, we, we often study something called resistance to water loss. Um, this is the only equation I'm going to go through uh, in the whole talks, but and it's pretty simple. So you have resistance to water loss uh, on the um, left side of the equation, and it's equal to the water vapor density gradient divided by cutaneous water loss rate. So rho, the density gradient, is basically how dry the environment is, and the water loss rate is what you measure in the lab. The only thing I want you to remember here is that a high resistance means a low cutaneous water loss rate, and a high cutaneous water loss rate means a low resistance. So they're inversely related. At the time of my dissertation, uh, all the studies basically pointed to this one foundational study in 1976, where they measured the rates of water loss of these salamanders, and well, one frog and one salamander species and concluded that they lost water through evaporation at rates similar to free water surfaces of the same size and shape. Their skin resistances are essentially zero. So what are they trying to say here? If you can imagine a salamander sitting on the forest floor, it's basically like they don't have any skin and they're like this floating blob of water and that they're basically losing water at rates that are similar to like a glass of water sitting on you know the counter of your table, but the same surface area and shape as a, as a little salamander. So a little floating blob of water. Now, uh, with armed with this knowledge, we could begin to develop a modeling framework uh, built in biophysics that helps us predict the fundamental niche of this animal. And how it works is we use biophysical principles combined with the physiological uh, data we had, uh, information we had about salamanders, which is they have no skin resistance, in order to predict durations of activity. And so this, this gives us the amount of time until they reach a certain dehydration threshold to consume food and find mates. But in particular, we were interested in how much time they had to eat, which gave us an indication of a metric of whether or not uh, they had sufficient energy to reproduce after accounting for maintenance costs. So uh, by integrating across uh, space, we could actually predict where these salamanders could potentially survive based on physiological uh, mechanisms. Uh, and then we could validate whether or not our model was working by using presence locations and seeing how well our model did. I do all of this in Python. You can find this all on my GitHub site. And these are broadly called mechanistic species distribution models, which are in contrast to more statistical correlative approaches. Okay, let's look at the results from the first mechanistic SDM I ever made. Um, what you're looking at here is a map of Southern Appalachia, although it doesn't look like much. Each one of these points represents a presence location of the species of interest. And you can see for activity time, the model saying that the salamander can only be active on average around one to two hours per night, not very long. Similarly, every single location across this map was in negative energy balance. So all these cool colors means that they're in, they do not have any, not only do they not have energy to reproduce, they don't have energy to even maintain their own bodies. So 0% of known localities can reproduce. Okay, so something's wrong. Let's go back and review some of our assumptions about salamanders, specifically that they lose water at similar rates to free water. 
Um, so uh, here's old Eric, younger Eric, <laughs> I should say, um, studying the uh, metabolic and water loss physiology of these salamanders using a flow through respirometry system where we can tightly control the temperature and humidities that these uh, salamanders experience um, based on the conditions they experience in nature. And we can measure all of these things in real time and look at how things change with respect to temperature and humidity. So if we assume salamanders have a skin resistance of zero, their total resistance is actually 2.8. I don't have time to get into that, but it has to do with boundary layer effects, basically how like the aerodynamics of how um, water vapor uh, uh, is moving across the animal into the environment. But what did we find? We found a value of around 8.4, which is different than 2.8, but it is still pretty close to water. So your skin is around 300 seconds per centimeter. So it's still pretty wet. Now, what happens when we integrate this value into our model? We get a very different picture of activity and energy balance where these salamanders can be active for uh, up to seven hours on average on a given night. And 83% of the known localities where we find them very commonly uh, are can uh, reproduce. So even this small change in skin resistance shows us that, well, their skin isn't water, but two, water loss physiology plays a really important part in their fundamental niche and actually um, describing where these species can persist. Now, one thing, if you're a careful observer that you might notice is that the model predicted that we would find salamanders up in this region when uh, we, well, we do find salamanders in that region. They're just not the species that I study. So if you look at this map over here, the net energy balance, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, you'll see all these red dots here. This is another similar species. In fact, you can't tell the difference between these unless you do alzheim data, which is, we figured all this out back in the eighties. Um, and they can reproduce together. So we can talk about if they're different species or not. They're very physiologically similar. Um, but so basically what this is telling you is that this is a general salamander model, a general terrestrial lungless salamander model. And it appears to work pretty well for a variety of species. So using this framework, we were able to answer some of these questions about you know, understanding the organismal traits that actually structure the fundamental niche. And we could actually measure it in real space. Um, uh, which is in contrast to the volume of a bunch of points we actually have across landscapes where salamanders can live. But another limitation to the fundamental niche that I found at least conceived the Hutchinsonian fundamental niche is really understanding what happens um, with novel environments, environmental conditions. So with climate change, we're expected to experience warmer and drier conditions. And if these conditions don't exist right now, which in many cases, there are a lot of non-analogous climates that don't exist, we don't really know if these animals can actually survive in those conditions or not. Uh, we don't have the, um, because they don't exist, we have no way of knowing. So um, this kind of leads to another question of how can we use the fundamental niche to predict responses to environmental change? And specifically, how can we use this same philosophy to understand how organisms might experience climate change and respond to it? Now, like any good framework, oops, there's a little typo in my uh, slides, um, it should be generalizable. So we should be able to switch out the, the organism that we're uh, working with. It might require different calculations, and we may need to measure a different aspect of their performance. In this case, we're talking about the energetics of homeothermy of regulating your body temperature, how costly it is to keep you warm when it's cold or keep you cool when it's hot. Um, these are uh, some of the really important factors that, that um, drive energetics of endotherms like birds and mammals. So this process of, of integrating these, um, uh, of integrating a new organism should work out just well. It's all the same physics, it's all the same heat flux, you just have to deal with uh, different aspects of, of the organism's physiology. This takes us to a very different environment. Uh, this is the Mojave Desert, um, where uh, I, my research was focused uh, in a postdoc during my postdoc in Steve Beisinger's lab. It's a very hot and arid uh, environment. If you have if you've never been, I would highly recommend you you go there. Despite it being so apparently inhospitable, there are. Uh, over you know, 135 species of bird that live there, some that specialize in deserts, some that are more generalist. 
And there are roughly 35 species of uh, small mammals, of, like these rodents that you're seeing here that, that call this place home. And one of the questions that we had uh, during my postdoc was how these two communities experienced environmental change over the last century. So what you're looking at here is a map of the Mojave Desert and the change in annual mean temperature that has happened over the last century. Each one of these black dots represents our sampling locations. I'm gonna talk more about those in just a second. But what you can see is that these environments have warmed pretty substantially already by almost two degrees in some locations. And that's the extent of climate warming that we're expected to see in several decades. So this desert provides a really interesting lens into how organisms might respond to changing environmental conditions, to novel conditions. Now this project really started a hundred years ago. Uh, Joseph Grinnell was the first director of the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley. And he had this great idea to go out into California and the West and basically collect specimens and take impeccably detailed notes about everything that he saw there, with the idea being that we could understand ecological change through time using his notes. So we see here, the greatest purpose of our museum was will not be realized until the lapse of many years, possibly a century. And this is that the student of the future will have access to the original record of faunal conditions in California and the West, wherever we now work. So Grinnell knew that we would use these data uh, to look at ecological change. He didn't know that climates would change to the extent that they have or, or that we're predicting them to. But all of this work was, uh, was really, I mean, his specimens are great and I used a lot of them, but his notes were incredibly valuable. He was a meticulous note taker. Um, you can see here where he had sketched out this uh, river where they sampled nearby, uh, indicating you know, exact sites where they camped, uh, different transects that they ran in order to search for birds, conduct surveys for birds and small mammals. He was so detailed, he would write what they had for breakfast that morning, who was out on the uh, survey with them that day, who was kind of being annoying that day. And to give you an idea, you know, he has this sort of quote here, the wind came up again about nine o'clock and has blown disgustingly all day. So he really helps you feel like you're there, you know, and, and here is this little fun detail, you know, just below, here's the verdant he found and the ruby crown kinglet. And um, so uh, his notes were incredible. Um, they also took pictures, which helped um, uh, people under in contemporary times uh, uh, go back to these very specific sites. You can see here is their uh, tent uh, campsite in the Sierras, and here it is 100 years later. Um, and again, some of these sites were actually pretty easy to find, right? This is El Cap in the dome and in Yosemite. Um, and so the big question that we had here is how can we leverage this data uh, from 100 years ago to really understand ecological change? And my postdoc advisor, Steve Beisinger, and several of his colleagues uh, attempted to ask this question by revisiting these sites. Um, here's the famous uh, Jim Patton and his wife uh, conducting transect surveys uh, throughout the state of California. Um, if you don't know Jim Patton, he's he's really awesome person um, and uh, great great guy um, and done incredible work. And here's Kelly Iknan, who uh, did most of the bird resurveying in the desert uh, for her dissertation uh, in Steve's lab. Now here's some of the sites again where we uh, conducted these these uh, surveys. And what you'll notice is that they're in black here in this case. Most of the sites are concentrated in national parks, which is a good thing because these national parks have experienced relatively little land use change uh, since the beginning of the century. And so much of the ecological change that can be, that has occurred, can hopefully be attributed to climate change. Now, like I talked about at the beginning of this, we were really interested in how small mammals and birds would respond to climate change. And we had a few different predictions for what this might look like. One of our first thoughts was, well, climate change is pretty intense in the desert. It's really hot and really dry. So we might expect some increase in habitat degradation, lower prim primary productivity, lower water availability, which would all spell bad news for anything that lived there. And under this scenario, we would expect both communities to decline. Alternatively, uh, it's possible that climate change has more direct variable impacts on these communities. 
And in which case, you know, that it could be due to their organismal traits, and in which case you could have increases or decreases or stability across this time. Um, so this would be, you know, a, a scenario in which we find different responses between the communities. Okay, so what did we find? Um, so here, what you're looking at is the change in species richness on the left. So you have the number of sites uh, on the um, y-axis. And then on the right, you have the change in occupancy on the x-axis, and this will be the number of species. So we have sites on the left and species on the right. And I'm going to show you the birds first. Oh, wait, first, this is um, just showing you and help you interpret the data. So anything to the left will be a decrease in species richness at a site or an increase or a decrease in occupancy uh, for a particular species, with occupancy being the probability that they actually exist at that site, controlling for their detection. Okay. Now let me show you the birds. So um, what we see uh, is a really strong signature for decline in species richness in the birds across sites. We lost on average 47% of the species at a given site. If we look at the species, the vast majority of species declined. Uh, the gray bars represent declines, but not statistically significant, where red represents statistically significant declines or increases in this one case of the common raven, which we can talk about later if you want. Um, so uh, really strong signature of collapse for the birds. Uh, we lost a, a lot of birds. What about the mammals? The mammals were very different. In terms of species richness, uh, there was essentially no change um, across all sites for species richness. And, um, and generally, there was very little change in occupancy for the species um, for each particular species. So species that were, you know, common 100 years ago are common um, uh, today, and, and there was really no change in, in the degree of uh, occupancy. So stability for mammals, collapse for birds. Now, what was interesting is that uh, the change in climatic conditions over the last century at these sites was correlated with the declines for birds, but not for mammals. So what you're looking at here is the mean annual precipitation of each site and the mean annual temperature. And I'm about to show you the points for these locations, which are correlated. And I will also show you a heat map showing the persist persistence values. So this is the probability that a species pers persisted from the beginning of the century to the end. So red colors mean low persistence, meaning a lot of animals are no longer found there after 100 years. So um, like I said, sites are generally either uh, dry and hot or wet and cool. And you see that as you get hotter and drier, you get to see these really low persistence values where you had fewer and fewer species that were persisting across uh, the century. There was no correlation with mammals. So I have nothing to show you in that regard. Uh, there was no correlation to persistence, no correlation to colonization. Uh, there was no effect of climate at these sites that we could find. And we did a lot of, you should dig into our supplement. It's huge. There's a lot to sink your teeth into there, um, but we couldn't find anything. Okay, um, so this pattern really supports this idea that climate change is having more direct impacts on the species themselves rather than the total habitat you know, collapsing. This is the collapse of birds, but not the small mammals. So it's likely that the traits of these animals plays really important roles in, in, uh, in how they've experienced climate change and, and uh, responded over the last century. And their traits are very different. So birds are diurnal. Uh, they live during the day. They can seek shade, but that only you know buffers you so much. It's still pretty hot out there. Some birds rarely can find these microhabitats to, to find really cool places, but it's rare and depends on body size. Small mammals are generally nocturnal, so they're able to uh, escape the most extreme uh, heat, uh, hot, hottest parts of the day. And they also live uh, underground in, in burrows. Um, so again, living underground is a great way to um, escape these really hot surface temperatures. So my goal uh, on this project was to develop a simulation that helped us understand how these two different animals experienced the environment over the last century. And this incorporated all sorts of uh, 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 physics in order to understand how hot birds and small mammals got in their environment, 
which included the effects of all different kinds of radiation, like direct solar radiation and reflected, the fact that small mammals live underground during the day and that they come out at night and are active on the um, surface of the ground. And what the model really is estimating is uh, how costly it is to maintain a stable body temperature in the face of all of this environmental variation, these fluctuating temperatures. So this is an example for a bird of what the model output looks like. Um, and it's simplified here just to, for the purposes of demonstration. On the x-axis here, we have time of day. On the y-axis, we have something called net sensible heat flux. All you really need to know is that zero is where you want to be as an endotherm. You don't want to be spending any energy to maintain a stable body temperature. Positive values mean that you need to produce heat, mean it's too cold, so it's cool in the morning and cool at night. And negative values mean you need to get rid of that heat. And generally, the, the only way to do that, the most effective way for endotherms is through uh, evaporative cooling, either across the skin or panting or, or um, something to that effect. So you can integrate these values to calculate the total amount of metabolic heat production or evaporative water loss that would be necessary to maintain a stable body temperature. And you can do this across landscapes in order to figure out where organisms are spending the most amounts of energy controlling their body temperature using the different um, cooling and heating methods. To build these birds, I used museum specimens, these virtual birds, I used museum specimens to, and I measured things like feather reflectance to understand how much solar radiation they absorb, dimensions, um, and characteristics of the feathers. For rodents, um, I focused more on pelage conductance, so the, the um, uh, how quickly heat travels across their fur, uh, as well as other pelage characteristics and as well as their dimensions. We did all sorts of validations for small mammals and for birds, and they were pretty good. So you can look at this is time of day on the x-axis. This is basically an estimate of how hot the animal gets uh, throughout the course of the day, their total heat load. Um, this is data from Blair Wolf's lab um, showing no statistical difference between predicted and observed values. And we also validated the models um, using real animals, real physiological data. Uh, and the models did pretty well at predicting uh, net sensible heat flux for, um, uh, for several birds and mammals, which I'm not showing here, but it was, it was good. I'll have to take my word on it here. Um, and that with um, values very close to unity for predicted and observed net sensible heat flux. Uh, and this is across over an order of magnitude and body size. So um, they work pretty well, which was really exciting. And to be honest, I didn't think it would work this well. And I was very excited and surprised. Okay, so the question now was very simple, is how has this, this physiological experience of the environment changed from the beginning of the century to the end of the century for both birds and mammals? So to visualize this, I'm gonna show you this representative landscape of uh, the Mojave Desert. So this is Death Valley here. Uh, here's the outline of the national park in this black dotted line. This is the increase in average air temperature during the spring when both ma small mammals and birds are generally active. You can see the hottest, it's gotten the hottest over the last century here in Death Valley. The model also incorporated other things like vegetation. So whether or not birds or small mammals could actually find locations that were shaded. Um, and addition, in addition, um, the soil depth, which was most relevant for small mammals, uh, because it basically uh, limits how deep they can go to escape the hot surface temperatures. And you don't have to go super deep, but you do have to go at least like 10, 20 centimeters to, to escape those really hot temperatures. Okay, so what, what did this representative landscape look like for the birds? So you can see that in Death Valley, we have you know, really high uh, increases in cooling costs over the last century. There's basically no area across this representative landscape that um, did not experience an increase in cooling costs, the amount of water that they need to cool off and keep their body temperature stable. And if we compare that to small mammals, the experience was incredibly different. In fact, most locations across this representative landscape didn't actually change very much in terms of cooling costs. We have some isolated regions where cooling costs did um, uh, increase very substantially. And a lot of this is because these are really shallow soils without any vegetation. 
And so cooling costs were 3.3 fold higher for birds compared to mammals. And if we look at the sites where we actually sampled over the last century, over 80% of those sites we estimated using these models um, did not experience any increase in cooling costs over the last century for small mammals. And for birds, it was again around 30% or so, in, uh, or a 30% increase in cooling costs. And the vast majority of sites experienced um, dramatic increases in cooling costs over the last century. It's very you know, natural to extend this analysis to what environments like might look like in the future. So these are uh, simulations for birds on the top panels and mammals on the bottom panels of what might happen. Um, the summary of this slide is, is basically that um, in the full sun, you can see small, small mammals can't really escape climate change forever. Um, and across the whole landscape, you know, there is a significant increase in cooling costs for small mammals. So will they continue to be stable as climates begin to change? I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, environments potentially may change with this further increase in warming. Um, certainly for birds, it doesn't look good either. Um, there's dramatic increases for birds. Um, so uh, the stability that we're seeing in small mammals isn't uh, guaranteed. And um, uh, it's something that um, should continue to be monitored. The other, um, what, what I also want to point out too for the last um, 15 minutes or so of my talk was that there was a lot of variation in cooling costs in birds, particularly relative to small mammals. And I wanted to sort of explore well, what was driving that variation in cooling costs um, with respect to birds. Uh, and um, uh, and, and basically, how can we how can we use these models to really understand how these traits drive variation in responses to climate change? So one of the interesting uh, results we found with birds was that the variation in the increase in cooling costs that a species experienced was correlated with their decline. So the more that you needed to cool off, the more that the species declined. But that wasn't the full story and not the complete analysis. What our analysis really showed us was that there is this really strong effect for birds with animal-based diets, a really high correlation, but for birds with plant-based diets, so herbivores and omnivores generally, no real relationship. And um, this sort of you know, got us thinking a bit about why that might be. We had some ideas since we conducted this analysis. But we really had to dig into the literature to really understand what was going on. And one thing that we noticed is that herbivores and omnivores are really known to be tied to surface water. So in experiments where they dump a bunch of radio-labeled isotopes into surface water in nature, then you take blood samples of all the birds that are around there. What it revealed was that avian granivores are most dependent on surface water. So you can actually tell who's drinking the surface water and who's not. And it's been known for a really long time that birds with animal-based diets don't really drink from uh, free water. And in particular, this is a, um, a um, observation from George Bartholomew that during the greatest time of heat stress, so during the summer, the cactus wren must rely exclusively on water obtained from its food. So these birds with animal-based diets, they have to get their water from their food. So if you need more water, you're gonna have to go out and find more food, generally. And so that would impose greater energetic costs on these animals, potentially greater physiological stress due to exposure, and potentially explain the reason for why we find this really tight correlation with um, diet. Now, what are some of the main traits that actually shape some of this variation in cooling costs? One of the biggest ones, hands down, was body size. And it does provide some really interesting insight. So you can see that body mass is really, you know, is tightly associated with the increase in cooling costs, sorry. Um, and um, although this is a log-log relationship, so there is actually a lot more noise than this. We included body mass in some of our analyses and specifically compared it to cooling costs um, because body mass could be related to all sorts of things like food and home range size and competitive ability. And model selection indicated 4.5 more support for cooling costs over body mass. So it did suggest that cooling costs were an important um, uh, were more important than body mass, suggesting this mechanism of cooling costs. But 
we can actually learn a lot too about what this pattern means. So what we found, of course, was that uh, the, we found this positive relationship with body mass and decline in occupancy. So bigger animals experience more declines than smaller animals. Um, and what was interesting is that was actually uh, the opposite of what we were expecting. So uh, Blair Wolf and Andrew McKechnie had published you know, quite a bit of papers looking at these catastrophic avian mortality events. And what they found or, or what their modeling suggested was that small birds would have a um, much higher chance of dying from climate change and especially heat waves because they proportionally lose water much quicker than big birds. And um, of course, that's not what we found, right? So we have these sort of two uh, competing ideas here where under acute and extreme conditions, we might expect small birds to decline and big birds to be better off. However, under more chronic gradual conditions, we might expect smaller birds to do better because they need less energy, they need less water. It's actually easier for them to um, balance their energy and water budgets. And this goes back to some ideas by McNabb, where I really like this quote where he talks about how large endotherms lose more water and heat at all temperatures than small endotherms, simply because their rates of metabolism and heat loss increase with body mass. And so we actually wanted to calculate this effect out. And so what you're looking at here on the x-axis is the body mass of the bird. And on the y-axis is the, the number, the increase in the number of insects that they would need to eat to offset those cooling costs. And so what you can see is there's this really dramatic increase in the number of insects that larger birds would need to eat and to find in order to balance their energy reserves. Whereas if you're a small bird, you may only need to find one grasshopper uh, or maybe uh, 10 of these hemipterans. However, if you're a larger bird, you may need to find uh, 15 or so, uh, and maybe up to 80 of these hemipterans in a day. Uh, extra, this is a, a, a above basal, so these are thermoregulatory costs. So that could be a, a really extreme pressure uh, on these animals and, and really help us understand how both body mass and diet interact to shape the responses to climate change in birds. And one of the take home points that I wanna um, share here is that our, our modeling and this trend of larger species declining suggests that it's more chronic exposure to temperature than acute um, that imposes these high water requirements and leads to their decline. Okay, so um, for the last five minutes or so, I, I wanna talk about um, some uh, new research that came out um, just about a month ago or so. And, and talk uh, briefly about how adaptation shapes the fundamental niche. Because again, the Hutchinsonian niche doesn't really allow us to think about how traits, well, one, we don't have traits, really, they're implicit in the Hutchinsonian niche. Um, but uh, we even know less about how they can evolve and what, what impact that has on their fundamental niche. One of the questions that we get often is how adaptation influenced the results that we've been talking about for small, mammal, small mammals and birds. And interestingly, we didn't really see a big effect. So here we have arid species of birds. They decline just as much as the forest, generalist, and grassland species. And, and not surprisingly, all of the species were pretty um, persistent for the small mammals here um, across uh, all these different species and all these different uh, types of uh, specializations or generalists. So really no signature of adaptation, which is weird because we know that small mammals are well adapted to desert environments, particularly these arid specialists. They have really unique renal physiology so that they don't have to drink very much. They can go into daily bouts of torpor to reduce energetic costs of thermoregulation. And of course they're nocturnal and they are burrowing. So we, we know about these traits. One of the traits that I was really interested in was um, their fur, their pelage, because uh, we've studied a lot about uh, rodent pelage or, or mammal pelage in terms of Arctic environments and really cold environments, but we know a lot less about what rodents do in really hot, arid environments. So like I explained briefly before, we studied pelage conductance. And so I built this device, which was a warm copper pipe uh, circulating at mammal body temperature. 
And we measured heat flux using a heat flux transducer. Here we have the specimen that we would put on top of the copper pipe, and then we'd measure the thermal, thermal gradient. And it basically measures how quickly heat is traveling across this, uh, the mammal fur. And we did this all on museum specimens. We also correct, well, we also, just so you know, we looked at some live specimens as well, um, recently sacrificed um, uh, house mice too, to, to look at the impact. And they were actually pretty similar. One of the first things we noticed was that arid species had really thin fur. So the distance from their skin to the outer tips of the hair was much lower than all of the other species. And this is kind of interesting because uh, really thin fur is really good at cooling off. It's really affected by wind. So here you're looking at a, um, an uh, older figure with fur depth on the x-axis and fur conductance on the y, showing that this thin fur has um, really high conductance and it's really affected by wind. So this is kind of cool because arid, specie, arid species need to cool off perhaps a little better because it's hot. So having this thin fur is potentially adaptive. But here was what was puzzling. When we look at the total insulation, we see that arid species had roughly the same insulation as generalists and grassland species. Woodland species had higher insulation. They generally had thicker coats. But we didn't expect to see this high insulation in arid species given how thin it was. So it's kind of like they're wearing like a really high performance jacket, like one that breathes really well, but is still really warm. And if we look at the conductivity of the fur, so basically the how much heat transfers through the fur uh, given its depth, so it's kind of like a material properties, if you will, we see that the conductivity is really low for these arid specialists relative to these other habitat species. So they have something unique going on with their fur. Um, and what that is exactly, it could be a lot of things uh, we don't really know, but they have low thermal conductivity, which was really cool. We conducted all sorts of phylogenetic analyses to, to look at patterns of relatedness and, and found uh, no support for uh, effect of relatedness or no support for a phylog phylogenetic signal for any of the traits that we were looking for. And thus with the differences in arid species and based on habitat that they prefer, this suggests some sort of extrinsic um, uh, selective uh, fact force from the environment that could be shaping this trait. So what I wanted to do was actually compare the uh, con conductivity of the fur of these animals using um, the estimates that we have of conductivity and compare arid species to the other species. And we could do this using the same modeling approach that compares, basically takes an arid species and simulates thermoregulatory costs with the conductivity that they have versus the conductivity of the other species that exist in this, their same habitat. And so the results provided this uh, really strong uh, signature for um, uh, an adaptive uh, benefit of having low thermal conductivity. So here, this is the thermoregulatory heating costs for small mammals with the observed conductivity. And if we give them the average conductivity, costs were anywhere from 15 to 20% higher over the course of a year. And that's a pretty big jump uh, for uh, a small mammal that they would have to eat 15 to 20% more fuel in order to offset those costs. Um, and we found this effect consistent across um, the year. It was basically, it varied by very little. Um, and so suggesting that um, uh, there was this adaptive benefit to having fur with really low thermal conductivity. Okay. So we've come a long way from thinking about this uh, fundamental niche. Maybe Hutchinson would tell me I thought a little bit too much about it. I don't know. But we have this new approach, this new ecophysiological approach that um, uh, I would say isn't super new. It's, it's started in like 1969, really. But, but it gives us a really quantitative way of um, uh, understanding how organisms function across real landscapes. And these are just some of the, of the take-home messages that I hope that you um, uh, have for my talk, which is that this approach, it provides an integrated framework that couples organisms and their environment. And so by in doing so, we can actually make testable, spatially explicit predictions about performance across space um, and real space. We can go to these locations and understand how environmental conditions affect organismal performance. And we can also isolate individual traits to understand how they influence the niche, performance, and adaptive evolution.
So, um, you know, of course, this is the fundamental niche. I'm sure I, um, many of you are also interested in the realized niche. I am too. That's pretty hard to predict from uh, using physics, but it's something that we are working on right now in my lab, trying to understand how the physiology of insects and their prey um, interact to structure performance and uh, the realized niche. Uh, we're actually studying this in tree swallows, so this slide is totally misleading, um, but uh, we are studying uh, damselflies. So um, we are trying to move into a direction of the realized niche, uh, but it is really complicated, and which is probably why not many people have attempted to do it. So uh, with that, I would just like to thank um, all of these collaborators and funding from uh, NSF and um, many other institutions. And with that, I will take any questions. Well done. I will clap for you, Eric. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's always the, the awkward uh, Zoom clap. Um, yeah, yeah. That was an amazing talk. I think you good. should give just that version. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, uh, I guess, Ricardo, I'll let you kind of manage questions in the audience there and other people, uh, if you want to raise your Zoom hand uh, and you can... I think we can unmute you, right, Ricardo? That's correct. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, I was going to say real quick, I noticed my last slides didn't have that all the pelage stuff for small mammals was um, recently in an evolution manuscript. So if you're interested, I would encourage you to go uh, read it. It just came out like a month ago. So you can find it on my website. Um, well, I'll start with a question. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm really... Uh, I think it was fascinating that your insect eaters, you know, have this big cost of thermoregulation or osmoregulation, really. Right. Trying to get, it's get kind the of water coupled. Diet. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like both, I guess. Right. Um, so what degree do you see, like, um, how, how much can they switch foraging tactics to try to reduce activity levels while they can gain more, in, like maybe more insect, like, Juicier insects with water, but less. Yeah. I don't know. Is there? Yeah, is, no. That's that? um, you know there is there isn't a ton of data out there on that. Um, generally, what you find is that when it gets really hot during the day, everybody seeks shade and does nothing. And mm -hmm. I think that you know the ability to sort of um, switch strategies is not really well observed, or uh, maybe hasn't been appreciated um, or discovered yet. Um, but at least for birds, it seems like in the Mojave, um, you know, temperature is this really intense limiting factor on when you can eat. Um, whether or not birds, you know, during active periods, during cooler periods, switch to more succulent insects, um, you know, I have no idea. This is also kind of, you know, the backdrop to this is really the decline in insects as well. Um, we tried to look for, you know, there's some estimates that insects have declined um, in various places uh, on the planet. Um, there, there isn't great evidence for that in Mojave. We, we actually did find some, and it's in our supplement as well, like are insects declining here? Is that the problem? Is it food? Um, and there wasn't great support for that either. It seemed like at least a lot of the insects that, um, uh, a lot of the insects uh, appear to be uh, I'm trying to remember um, exactly what we found, but but we didn't find great support for declines in insects or a really great sensitivity of the, the insect prey over the last century. So um, yeah, I, it's the insects, what birds do to find different insects, all great and also probably extremely difficult things to study. Um, it, I mean, it does, what I would say is that, you know, so, so what's happening in the desert? Are, are the birds dying? It's, it's probably that birds are just leaving the desert. Um, there have been some records uh, of acute mortality uh, of birds um, where you know, uh, national park rangers have actually seen birds drop out of the sky when it's 135 you know, degrees out. Um, but, but most likely what's happening is that you know, birds are highly mobile and they're probably just leaving the desert, particularly ones that aren't specialized in it um, and shifting to to um, other areas. There's lots of evidence for that. Um, yeah, that would be my long-winded response to your question. <laughs> it's okay, you can be long-winded. 
Um, are there questions in the room or on Zoom? I see some in the queue. I assume there are two questions, yeah. Let's see. Uh, with connectivity of small mammal fur taken from museum specimens, was there any noticeable seasonal changes from molting? Uh, there was actually. Um, so uh, we we didn't have a good enough sample sizes to uh, look at um, like monthly changes, but we did look at uh, cool versus dry seasons, and there was an effect where um, oh, that's actually interesting. Uh, conductance change. So, so overall insulation change in the winter, they had more insulation than in the summer, but I actually don't know if conductivity changed. I might, I, that's actually a really good question. It's probably even in my results, uh, but I can't remember the result, but they're, um, they clearly do change between summer and winter. Um, and I'm not sure if the actual properties of the fur itself changes. Um, thanks, Rebecca. How much do you think the lack of response in small mammals is due to the protection imparted by the national park boundaries? In other words, if you were to repeat the analysis in a heavily damaged grazed rangeland um, outside the park boundary, would you expect different results? It seems like grazing habitat alteration by human might really impact. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a really good thought. Um, we did look at in the multi-species occupancy model, we did try to account for things like uh, grazing and uh, fire regime because we had some pretty decent data. I'm sure you're actually, um, I'm sure you're familiar with that data as well. Um, um, and we found, again, no support for uh, grazing uh, or uh, fire regime in those areas. It could be different in areas outside of those um, sites. Uh, we did have some sites that were not in national park boundaries, and we didn't um, we didn't notice any uh, statistical evidence of of that sort of effect. Um, it could be. I mean, the other thing that I know you're also familiar with too is that another big issue is invasive species. That the some of the plant communities have really changed over the last century, and in some cases, small mammals have more food to eat than they did 100 years ago, or um, uh, potentially different types of food. Um, so that's something that we also could not account for in um, our models. We did see that a lot of the vegetation that was there 100 years ago is still here now. Um, whether or not those abundances have changed, we don't know. Um, but yeah, no, that, that's a, it's a good question. Um, and it looks like you had another question too. How much of the changes in occupancy or lack of change in case the mammals could be due to new species moving into the system as others are lost? That is an excellent question and one that I totally skipped over because of time. Um, there was significant species turnover for small mammals in uh, our surveys. So each site had on average eight species and there was a turnover of two species per site. So um, whatever that is, 20, 5% uh, turnover. Um, so uh, that turnover, again, not statistically correlated with any environmental variable. We did another multi-species occupancy modeling approach where we looked at, um, tried to look at biotic interactions. So we were looking at the probability of two species uh, persisting at a site together over time. Uh, and so we did all possible combinations of all the species. And we found like some evidence, like some existing interactions that may be having an effect. Um, some may be driven by habitat. They're, they're often confounded with one another, so it's hard to know. Um, uh, but there was a lot of turnover in mammals. There was barely any turnover in birds. Uh, birds was just dramatic declines. Um, so um, uh, does that answer your question? How much of the changes could be due to new species moving in? Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I don't know about any like totally new species that came in, um, but there was a lot of species turnover. And I would again point you to the supplement. There was that really cool Kelly, Iknan, and Steve had developed these really cool you know multi-species occupancy models. That, they didn't develop them, but they implemented them um, to uh, look at species interactions over time. Um, and it was really cool, but ultimately really hard to pull any sort of like definitive um, mechanistic explanation. It was like, oh yeah, this makes sense based on, we know that these two species interact and compete for resources, but you know, we did find some interactions that were like not easily explained, could be due to habitat or just like a statistical correlation. So it was hard to know. <laughs> 
Yes. Eric, um, I'm wondering, I guess you have the photo, the photo, the photographs from the Grinnell uh, expeditions, but I can remember being a grad student at the University of Texas, and we used to go out to West Texas, out into the Chihuahuan Desert, and of course it's, you know, it's pretty dry and sparse there, and so, but you can look at photos from the 19th century, and it was, and I can never remember which one it is, it, it, the tall grass or short grass prairie, whichever one it was, reached all the way down in there, and uh, you could you could look at these historical photos. It was like a completely different landscape. Of course, right. they put their cattle and sheep in, and they they ate it down to nothing, and it turned into just you know it's a beautiful desert now, but it looked completely different. And so, is there? I don't know what it has to do with with the rodents and the birds, but is there any evidence of that in the Mojave? I know that's a very that's very different uh, circumstances, but at least in Chihuahuan deserts and some of these others, like the, the plant, the plant uh, diversity have really, really changed. And in fact, I think what they're talking about is because of that change, it's even, uh, even before they were talking about global climate change, they were saying that that was changed, but that was just from these right. effects of, you know, all this cattle and sheep grazing. Right. Yeah. You know, um, a part of, Part of it was that, you know, these sites were in national parks, which did sort of limit some of those effects of grazing. And th there were, like like you said, there there were some changes in terms of invasive species that arrived. Um, and one thing that is cool is what I didn't show, which probably because I don't have a great, I mean, I could show that, but um, we do have some landscape photographs that looked at, you know, uh, things like creosote and other types of bushes. And from, you know, I'm not a botanist, but from my somewhat naive eye, you know, it looks fairly similar in terms of what you see now. We could do presence and absence in terms of what we saw in the photograph and what, what we couldn't. It, it generally looked like it does now. Um, but, you know, of the data that we had, which was the grazing data and uh, fire regime data, those types of things, um, we found no correlation with those. And generally, the habitats within the national park were, you know, um, less affected by land use change and things like that, just because they were in these national parks and protected for so long. So, um, I, I think that they were minimized. Um, I, it's a it's a great, um, you know source of inquiry and, and something to, to go after, um, especially, you know, looking at things like uh, one of Steve Beisinger's, his last um, graduate student, actually, Danielle Perryman, uh, she's looking at isotopes in small mammal fur. And so that might be one of the ways to actually answer that question, um, looking at isotopes and um, from, they have the, all of the, you know, Grinnell's original uh, yeah. specimens, and, and then they have recent ones from Jim Patton as well. So that's, um, and she, did she tell me those results? I don't, I can't, I, I can't speak confidently about that. So you should invite her to give a talk. She's great. Yeah. And one little note, uh, and I'm a herb guy, but I will second your thing. Jim Patton's got to be one of the nicest humans walking the earth. <laughs> uh, I got, I was lucky enough to, they put my desk right next to his in the museum. And uh, on days when we were both in, we didn't get much done. We just kind of <laughs> chatted and he showed me pictures and we end up, buried in one of his old like you know specimen racks him showing me some mammal I had no idea what it was and but he was nerding out about it. he was a really great guy so I'm I'm um I would love to get back there and hang out with him more that's great all right let's see any other questions great. there's another vote for Jim is the best Jim is the best <laughs> <laughs> yeah. lots of votes Everybody else just is abstaining because we don't know him. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. And um, I really enjoyed talking about my research with, with you all. So Yeah, well, that was great. You know, I, I feel like more and more biology degrees are tempted to take physics out because it's hard for the students. And I think your talk is a really great example of why it's really important. Yeah, physics was not my favorite class, and I'm not very good at it. 
in all honesty. <laughs> I didn't create any of these equations. I just learned how to code. And so, um, uh, yeah, I totally agree. It, it can, not only does it give you insight into biology and your career, but like it helps you understand the world around you. So uh, I strongly encourage it. Yeah. Whoa, well, thanks, Eric. I look forward to seeing you at Uh Me too. I can't wait. Yeah. Thanks again. Conference. Yeah. Woohoo. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. All right. Bye, everybody.